being a mom is both wonderful and taxing. It's a, it's a painful thing to be a parent, isn't it? I don't mean just in the sense of delivering a baby, which I hear is quite painful. I mean just watching that child, you know, every, every time they have a sniffle, every time they go through a pain, every time something comes into their life that's new or dangerous, any time they head off in some direction that you don't think they have any concept of, of how difficult things are going to be, as a parent you ride this roller coaster with them, don't you? And it's a very difficult thing to do well. Well, this morning we're going to look at the mother of Jesus, and we understand that she had some real roller coaster experiences in her life, but we want to go back. We want to go back before she was a mom. And what we're trying to do during the Advent season is look at Christmas coming to broken people. And we want to look at some of the brokenness that's involved in these characters. That, because before they were stars, they were people. And Mary, of course, has, has got this great star now. She's a centerpiece of the Christmas story, but we forget that she was just a teenager from Nazareth before all of this came upon her. And what I want to do this morning is I want to highlight some of this, and I want you to see some of the difficult issues that Mary had to grapple with, some of the, the repercussions of the choices that God was making for her and the choice that she made for herself. I'm going to go back to the text and just comment on a few of the things. It says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, now Elizabeth was her aunt, remember that, the mother of John the Baptist, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary, which is where Mary lived. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel, the angel, appeared to her and said, greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Now, that would have freaked you out just a little bit, wouldn't it? Because I can't imagine that it was just, hey there, that, that this is a big, powerful angel that must have intimidated her. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. And I'm sure that the first thing she thought in her mind was, are you sure you got the right address? I mean, you're talking to me? Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her. You found favor with God. Hmm. You will conceive and give birth to a son. And now imagine the confusion running around in her head here. Um, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary had been raised in a Jewish home. She knew what the angel was saying, I believe, that you are going to be the mother of this long-awaited Messiah. And Mary said, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. In other words, she's saying, you know, the wedding is still a ways off, angel. How, now how's this going to happen? And the angel said this, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. Now I know what you're thinking, Mary. This is impossible. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People thought that was impossible. They used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month of pregnancy because nothing is impossible with God. And then these great words. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Now remember, Here's, here's the highlights of the story, that Mary is a teenager, probably maybe 14 to 16 years old. She's already engaged to be married to this guy, Joseph, and it was probably an arranged marriage. She's told she's going to have a baby, but this baby isn't going to be from Joseph. And not only is this baby going to be not from Joseph, this is going to be no ordinary baby. This baby is going to be the Messiah that has been waited for for centuries. Maybe you could even say for thousands of years. And Mary, even though she's confused, she doesn't know how this can happen, she doesn't know what's going to happen, says, okay, I'm in. So let's go back here and look at a couple of the factors in the story. The first thing is that she is unmarried. And nowadays, we're not um, startled so much by people who have babies when they're not married. And maybe that's a sad commentary on our society, but it's, it's not that big a deal anymore. But it was a big deal back then. 
You end up pregnant and you're not married, you are considered to be an immoral woman. And let's face it, most people are not going to ask questions. She's pregnant, we know she's not married, duh, we know how people get pregnant. She was immoral, she was not doing what she was supposed to do. She was a bad woman. And even if they had given Mary a chance to explain, how's that going to go? Well, I, I know it's not Joseph's baby, but it's actually the baby of the Holy Spirit. Okay, come on. I mean, you and I both know how people are going to respond to that. Sure, Mary. Baby's from the Holy Spirit. An angel appeared to you. Uh-huh. So Mary, by saying yes to God, is in this position where she knows she's going to be branded She's going to be branded an immoral woman, and her child is going to be branded an illegitimate child. She still said yes. Mary was dealing with this uh, deal that was really blatantly unfair. We know the true story. We know that Mary was not doing anything wrong. We know that she was actually doing incredibly brave things by saying yes to the Lord. But Nobody else knew it at the time. And I think right away we, we identify with Mary because there's all kinds of people in the world, lots of people in the sanctuary who have to endure things in life that are not their fault. That you are born with a certain body shape, that you are born with some mental restrictions, you are born into a particular family, maybe you were abused when you were younger. There's all kinds of things. You're, you have some kind of disability. Um, you, you're born with a certain skin color. Whatever the case may be, these are all things that you have nothing to do with. That this isn't, you know, this is just what you were dealt. But what we learned from Mary is that you take what you've been dealt and you give it to the Lord and seek to use it for his glory. The second thing we see here is that Mary's engaged. Hmm. Now, again, we need to get back into that day and age and understand that an engagement back then was a very complicated process. That in many cases it was a negotiation between two families. And, and money would be exchanged, you know, because I'm getting your daughter and taking her out of your house, and so I'm going to compensate you for that. And so the, the man would build a home before the wife ever came there, before they ever consummated the relationship and so it was complicated. Lots of things were in motion here. And an engagement was a contract. And it was a contract every bit as binding as the marriage itself. And so the fact that Mary is going to show up pregnant before Joseph could have possibly been the father creates some huge difficulties for Mary. This could have brought legal action that she would be branded an adulteress, an obvious adulteress. Here's the evidence of her adultery. She's pregnant. She could have been humiliated publicly. She could have actually been executed as an immoral woman. And don't you wonder, I mean, I, I wonder what happened when she told her parents. Wouldn't that have been an awful conversation? Mom, Dad, I'm pregnant. And even though she tried to explain it, I wouldn't have been surprised if dad didn't say, you have shamed the family. We want nothing more to do with you. And then there's Joseph. How do you tell him? I mean, we're told that Joseph had the help of an angel, and we'll talk about Joseph next week and the remarkable man that he was. But how do you tell him? Was there a lot of shouting? Were there a lot of tears? Was there a lot of heartache as all this news was coming out? I don't know, but it couldn't have been easy. The third thing I want you to see about Mary is that she was being given an enormous responsibility. Remember, she's a teenager, a young teenager, and she's being told that she is going to raise the Messiah. She is responsible for raising the Son of God. Don't you think that would freak you out just a little bit? 
I get freaked out driving in Chicago traffic sometimes, you know? I mean, and, and that's nothing compared to being responsible for God's son. It's a huge responsibility. She must have felt very out of her league here. Why? And what, how am I going to do this? I'm just a teenager. What do I know about raising kids at all, much less God's son? How is this going to work? How am I going to raise a king? How am I even going to get him to be king? I don't know how this is going to work. I wonder, were there nights when, when Mary laid in bed thinking, what have I gotten myself into? How is this going to work? Lord, I don't know how I, I, I can't do this. Or, or did she maintain that incredible trust throughout that anytime she got worried, anytime she got overwhelmed, did she just say to herself, you know, God has called me to this task and God will provide what I need. I don't know. All right, I, I want you to see a couple of things from Mary's story. First of all, I want you to see how it speaks to those who are falsely accused. Um, it's not always easy to follow the Lord, is it? And, and probably all of you at one time or another have been in a position where you were trying to do the right thing and you got hammered for it. You tried to say the right thing, especially, you know, guys sometimes say that with their wives. You know, you try to say the right thing, but it's always the wrong thing. I don't know how that works, but it's always the wrong thing. And, 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 you, and you get in trouble, and you're trying to do the right thing, and you, you, you know, you get nailed for it. Well, what we see here is that Mary took that pain. And, and there is pain. When you are misrepresented, when you are uh, misinterpreted, when your actions are twisted so that they, they are something that you never intended, it hurts. When uh, Jason Gray was here a couple of months ago, one of the things he said to me was that he was learning that you need to give people permission to misunderstand or misrepresent you. I thought, hmm, that's pretty profound, really. That you need to give people permission to misrepresent you. You need to give them permission to misunderstand you. Why? Because people are going to do it. And the truth is, we do it. We do it towards other people. We misrepresent them. We jump to conclusions. We, we twist what other people are doing. We assume that we know why somebody did something, even though we may not know why they did it. And you know, even when we look in the mirror in the morning, we sometimes misrepresent ourselves. We see somebody that is way better than they really are, or oftentimes we see somebody who is way worse than they really are. And so we need to give other people permission to misrepresent and misinterpret the things that we're doing. And I think what Mary understood is something that you and I need to understand that somewhere along the line, we need to remind ourselves that God knows the truth. God knows the truth. He knows our heart. He knows what we intended. He knows what we're trying to do. And when all is said and done, that's the only opinion that truly matters. And so there's a matter of entrusting ourselves to him and understanding that someday God will vindicate us. And, and you read the stories in, in Psalms, and every once in a while you hear a psalmist say, Oh Lord, vindicate me by my righteousness. And I think I would never say that because it sounds to us like he's saying, Lord, please, because I'm such a good guy, vindicate me. But that's not what he's saying. What the psalmist is saying at that time is saying, Lord, you know the circumstances, and this time... This time, not every time, but this time, you know that I'm being falsely accused. This time, you know that I'm being misrepresented. And he entrusts himself to God. And so we learn from this that sometimes character wins out. Sometimes people know you. Sometimes people study you. Sometimes people say, you know, I know that person. I don't believe that at all. Sometimes that doesn't happen. But God always knows the truth. And if you've been misrepresented, God knows the truth about you. And God is there to stand by you. The second thing we see is that Mary must have felt very overmatched by life. She must have felt like there was this big tsunami kind of wave coming at her and somehow she was supposed to swim in it, you know? That now she is supposed to raise the Son of God. She has no idea what to do. Well, that happens in lots of lives. Let me give you some ideas. This happens when your doctor tells you you've got cancer. 
or tells you that your child has leukemia or that someone you love has Alzheimer's disease. It happens when you are sentenced to prison or you have to endure the sentence or separation of someone that you love who is being sent to prison. You feel overwhelmed when a loved one dies suddenly. You don't have any idea what to do. You just feel completely lost. Or you're in a job where you're facing unrealistic ex expectations. I can't possibly do everything that they're asking me to do. Your spouse tells you, you no longer, they no longer want to be married to you. Your child has special needs. Depression dogs your every step and you just can't shake it, this darkness that walks with you. When you face an addiction, when you battle an addiction, you feel like you're completely overmatched. When you have a checkered past which has left you with a reputation that provides very prominent scars. Or maybe your financial situation changes suddenly. Let's face it, life is difficult. And there are things in life that come upon us that we feel are just too big for us to handle. And, and don't, you, don't you admire Mary? Man. Wouldn't you have been tempted to say, <laughs> no way, Jose. I'm not interested. I don't want the gig. I, I, I'm, I'm not strong enough to handle this. But that's not what she did. And we say, well, well, how are we supposed to handle these things? Well, the thing that I, I like about this, the thing that we learn is that God routinely works through people who are overmatched, people who feel overwhelmed. I mean, think about it. You got, you got Joseph, remember him? He had all these brothers, and the brothers didn't like him. They thought he was dad's favorite because he was. And so they took care of it the way that many of us wish we could have taken care of it with our siblings. They just sold him, you know? <laughs> They just sold them to make a profit. And, and, and God took that, that broken, overwhelmed guy, even though he went to, to prison, he was falsely accused, all the stuff that happened, and used him to save Israel. Moses, when he was given the job, he said, Lord, I don't want it. Use my brother. My brother talks better than I do. Don't pick me. And God picked him anyhow. And the prophets came along as, uh, as guys who were really just dudes. There was nothing special about them. And God says, I want you to go and, and talk to the nation of Israel. And, and I'm sure many of those prophets said, me? Even David. Remember when he was a kid? He had all these brothers. He was the youngest of the seven. And, and remember the day that he went out to fight Goliath? He was just a little kid at that point. And his brothers saw him coming, and they said, oh, what's he doing here? Go home. You're just a little kid. Get out of here. We don't need you here. And can you imagine what they said when they saw him walking out there towards Goliath? Oh, great. Our hands are in the, in the hands of David. We are in deep weeds now. And yet God used him. God uses people who are overmatched. God uses people who feel like they've got nothing to offer. In fact, you look at the disciples, that, what a ragtag group of guys those were. I mean, think about it. The, there, was no, there were no celebrities there, no guys that were especially gifted. So why does God do this? Why does God use people like that? Because I believe that God understands that when we feel most inadequate, we are most likely to put our entire trust in him. See, the problem is when we feel that we are able to do things, when we feel competent, we start trusting ourselves rather than him. And that's always a bad place to be. You may feel that God could never use you. In fact, you may feel that God could never love you because of the things that have happened in your past. You may feel God couldn't love you because of the things that are going on in your present. And you say, if God knows what's happening in my life, I am lucky that he hasn't stricken me dead. But understand something. God still loves you and wants to use you. He still reaches out to you. You may be overwhelmed by life, but he is faithful. Just like he was with Mary. The amazing thing about Mary, isn't it, that that after all of this, after all God tells her, after all, I mean, if she thought about this at all, how intimidating it must have been. 
And she says, okay, okay. Whatever it is you want, God, I'm in. Now, the question that I have is, how in the world does a teenager, much less anybody, how do I get to that point of faith? I've got two suggestions for you. Number one, I think it starts by focusing on who is doing the asking rather than on who is being asked. See, we need to focus on the sufficiency of God and not the weakness that we have. As I read God's word, as I'm confronted with opportunities, how I respond to that is going to depend on whether I'm looking at my ability or that I'm looking at the ability of God. Mary recognized that it was the Lord talking to her, that he was sufficient. If, if, she had cho- if he had chosen her, there must be a reason. And even though she didn't understand, she was willing to trust him. She kept her eyes on the Lord rather than looking on her own weakness. I get into trouble when I focus on my ability to do a task. Some days I look at my ability and I say, you know, I I can handle this. And inevitably I find out that I can't because you can only do some things, everything, really, anything of significance in his strength and not our own. But you know, more often than not, I look at my weakness and I see my insecurities and I see my flaws and I think, God, I'm not the guy. You don't want me. I can't do this. And Mary reminds us that we've got to stop looking at us. And we've got to start looking at him. What he commands, he gives the strength to do. Second, we need to learn to trust God more than we trust our ability to understand or to figure things out. Think about it. What what God was asking Mary to do could easily have been seen as crazy, at least from her perspective. It doesn't make any sense. Why not pick a royal princess? Why not pick somebody who's already in the castle? Why not pick somebody who's already got a political clout? Why a teenager? Why not get somebody a little bit more mature, somebody who's got some experience in raising a child, for crying out loud? But see, if we have to understand before we walk with God, we're going to spend a lot of time standing still. Just recently, Somebody told me that in the times when I'm trying to wrap my head around something, and I actually said this to this person, I'm trying to wrap my head around this, and they said, stop it. Because when you're trying to wrap your head around something, that's when you're least likely to live faithfully. Because what you're really trying to do is control the situation. You want to control the situation. You want to understand it. You want to be able to figure it out. You want to trust your ability We need to understand because we want to be in control. And as a result, we resist fully trusting him. Because when we are in control, he is not. So if we want to emulate the faithfulness of Mary, I guess what we have to do is we need to open our Bible and listen rather than argue. We have to obey without always expecting to understand. We will say yes even before we have all the answers. That will be difficult for us. But it's the only way to truly live by faith, and we see that played out in Mary's life. She's a great example for us. This young woman stepped out in faith. She probably had moments where she wondered what she had gotten herself into. I wonder if there were nights when she cried herself to sleep. However, she shows us that all God needs is a willing heart. Whatever we lack, he will gladly and effectively supply. And if we dare to trust him, he will not only change us, but he may just change the world through us. Let's pray together. Father, it terrifies us to think of living this kind of faith to uh, hang on to you even when we're getting clobbered by the world or to move forward when the mountain seems so big and overwhelming. Thank you for Mary. Thank you for her example. Thank you for her faithfulness. Thank you for 
reminding us that she was just an ordinary person who was willing to trust the extraordinary God. In those times where we feel that we have nothing to offer, remind us that all you want from us is a yes. Father, help us to this end, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We've got another video.